Good morning, and welcome to Pathway Community Church Online. We're so excited that you decided to join us this morning. If gathering with us is the norm for you, or if this is your first time, welcome here. Here at Pathway, we're a family of individuals who have found life in Jesus Christ and simply want as many people as possible to experience that exact same thing. We're really excited about today because today we're entering a new series called NUMA. In the NUMA series, we're going to be looking at what it means to live a spirit-filled life. Now we're going to begin in just a moment, but before we do, we want to let you know about a fantastic resource that is available to you. It's called Right Now Media. It's an online platform where you can explore Bible studies, devos, and children content in the comfort of your own home anytime. To get free access today, simply go to pathwaycc.net slash get the app. Once again, thank you for joining us this morning, and now let's begin with some worship. Today is a, a beautiful day. I'm so glad you're with us. Uh, I invite you guys to, to stand and sing with us. Even if you're, at, I know you're at home and you're with people, and sometimes it's a little awkward, but there, there's something special that happens when we, when we stand and sing as a, as a family. So join us as we sing this. Higher than the mountains that I face Stronger than the power of the grave Constant in the trial and the change Is one thing remains Higher than the mountains that I face Stronger than the power of the grave Constant in the trial and the change This one thing remains This one thing remains Your love never fails and never gives up Never runs out on me Your love never fails and never gives up Never runs out on me. The love never fails and never gives up. Never runs out on me. The love. And on and on and on and on it goes. And it overwhelms and satisfies my soul. Never runs out on me. Your love never fails and never gives up. Never runs out on me. Your love never fails and never gives up. Never runs out on me. Your love. In death, in life, I'm confident and covered by. Never runs out on me. Your love never fails and never gives up. Never runs out on me. Your love never fails and never gives up. Never runs out on me. Your love. On and on and on it goes. And it all. Satisfies my soul, and I'll never ever have to be afraid. This one thing remains. This one thing remains. Your love never fails, it never gives up. 
never runs out on me. Your love never fails and never gives up, never runs out on me. Your love never fails and never gives up, never runs out on me. surround me with the song of deliverance from my enemies till all my fears are gone I'm no longer a sect of fear I am a child of God I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. From my mother's womb, you have chosen me. Love has called my name. I've been born again to your family. Your blood flows through my veins. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. I'm no
Giving is an integral act of worship that expresses our gratitude, faith, and love for others. 
Generosity flows from a belief that all we have are or ever will be is not ours to hold on to. It's ours to share because God has shared his wealth with us and we seek to bring glory to God. If you would like to give to Pathway Community Church, here are four ways that you can do that. You can send us an online bill payment, send us an e-transfer, set up automatic withdrawals, or stop by our office sometime to give an in-person donation. For more information, please visit us at pathwaycc.net slash give. Good morning, everyone. I'm glad you could join us this morning as we start a new series called NUMA. Now, NUMA is a name given to the Holy Spirit, and it is a fantastic name. We're going to be studying that as we go through this series. And I'm really, really excited for what we could gain through this together. I am an individual that grew up with the topic of the Holy Spirit as being almost a taboo topic. Not because people didn't appreciate the Holy Spirit, but because there were so many other things going on in the conversation that it made the conversation uncomfortable. So here's my invitation to you. Let's get uncomfortable. Let's get uncomfortable with what the Bible says about the Holy Spirit, what it says about how the Holy Spirit leads us and how the Holy Spirit fills us because there's something here that may challenge what we grew up with, but in a great way. And in the same way that there were things that would have challenged the disciples in terms of what they grew up with, in terms of what it meant for the Spirit of God to now be dwelling in them and empowering them to do incredible works of ministry. So I'm excited about that this morning and in this series. If you have your Bibles with you, I want to encourage you to take a turn to the book of Joel. The book of Joel. Now, if you do not know where the book of Joel is in the beginning of your Bible, there is a table of contents. And people worked really hard to put it there. Don't be ashamed to use it. Joel chapter 2, and I'm going to be reading verses 28 and 29. Joel chapter 2, verses 28 and 29. Now, some of you might be new to us, and some of you are probably regulars for us here at Pathway Community Church, but one of the ways we like to show respect for God's Word here at Pathway is we do like to stand for the reading of His Word. So when you have it, would you please stand with me as we read Joel chapter 2, verses 28 and 29. Here's what it says. And afterward, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. Let's have a word prayer together. Lord God, I thank you so much for this morning. I thank you that you are God and we are not. I thank you that we believe in you as the Father, God, the creator of all things, the one who sustains and is sovereign and providential. We thank you, Jesus, who you're the Son, and we thank you that you are God incarnate. You are God with us, and we thank you, Holy Spirit, that you are Spirit, the third member of the Trinity, equally sovereign, equally eternal, And you dwell in us. And so, Jesus, as we are looking into your word this morning, we pray that we will gain a greater appreciation for the emphasis you place on the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, that we would gain a better understanding of who you are in our lives so that we may live out this faithful calling that you call us into. In your name I pray. Amen. You can have a seat at home. Um, Thank you for standing with me. I know that might seem a little weird. You're rising in front of your device or your television, but there's just something neat about honoring the Word of God together. So I'm just going to dive right in. Uh, This topic of pneuma, this topic of the Holy Spirit, is something that I do like to cover every year as we get close to Pentecost, and, and it's just seemingly the appropriate time for us to be talking a little bit more about the Holy Spirit because it's a special time Uh, in our Christian calendar. We celebrate Jesus twice a year, actually. And to some extent, we celebrate the Father at Christmas. So we got the Father and Jesus at Christmas, we got Jesus at uh, at Easter, and we have the Holy Spirit at Pentecost in terms of how we see things playing out within this Christian calendar. And as we talk about the Holy Spirit, as I mentioned before, there probably are a lot of us who might be a little bit uncomfortable with this topic. 
And a lot of that has to do with some of the stuff that maybe we've either heard, had people say to us, uh, maybe even some experiences we've had, or lack of experience that we've had. The topic of the Holy Spirit is something that makes people uncomfortable a lot of the time. But that is not the way it's intended to be. As a matter of fact, what I want to share with you this morning coming from Jesus is that us experiencing the Holy Spirit together as a body of believers and as individuals is something that is to be normative for the Christian walk. And as a matter of fact, Jesus even said that it was better for us to have the Holy Spirit. And so it's important that we talk about this this morning. So let's rewind a little bit. We're going to talk about uh, the Old Testament for for now, Joel chapter 2, verses 28 and 29. We just read that this morning. Joel is one of the minor prophets, and you could say that the theme within the book of Joel as a minor prophet, actually, I'll back up. The reason he's called a minor prophet is not because he's less than anybody else. The reason he's called a minor prophet is because he has a shorter book. So he's one of the 10 minor prophets. That's it. It's the only reason behind it. It's not a hierarchy thing. And so within the book of Joel, what we have is Joel talking to Jerusalem and Judah and saying, listen, if you turn your face and your attention and your hearts back towards the Lord, He will bring you salvation and heal your land. And that's it. That's the message of it. And in the context of this, it actually starts off with Joel chapter 1, where Joel starts talking about this army of locusts that come in and they just devastate the land. And as the nation of Israel screams out to the Lord, we have a response from God that we read this morning talking about the coming of the Holy Spirit. Now, all throughout the Old Testament, the Spirit of God would come upon leaders in very special ways or ancients of God, agents of God, sorry, to do His work. Most of the time, the Spirit's presence would be temporary or just a, a dealing with a present issue or pressing issue at the time. Maybe a problem, maybe a need, maybe a battle, those kinds of things. But in a few cases, like the case of King David, the Spirit of God would not depart from David. And as a matter of fact, we're told that the, Spirit, uh, the presence of the Spirit living permanently in David is something that David talked about regularly in the book of Psalms. But this presence of the Spirit living permanently in all of God's people was a promise that was associated with the coming of the Messiah and the formation of God's new people. Now, this is important, because what this then means is, is that if you are a person who considers yourself a follower of Jesus Christ, you have His Spirit in you. He dwells within you. The promise from Joel chapter 2 was the first of several key scriptures that Peter quoted in his sermon during Pentecost. That day brought the dawn of a new church coming and the coming of the Holy Spirit as promised in Joel's prophecy. The Spirit first came to those who proclaimed a professing knowledge in Jesus, and all those who then accepted Jesus after Peter's message received the Holy Spirit, and they were sealed by the Holy Spirit for salvation. We read about that in Acts chapter 2, verses 38 and 39. And even as, as far as that goes, the book of Acts has undergone a number of different kinds of names. Did you know that it was originally called the Acts of the Holy Spirit? That was the name of the book of Acts. And now we, we refer to it as the Acts of the Apostles, whom the Holy Spirit, of course, empowers, but it was originally called the Acts of the Holy Spirit. All that to say this, and this is critical in terms of where we understand where we are in the history of God's people. We live in the age of the Spirit. That's when we live. All throughout the Old Testament, you have this idea that, that God was above Israel and His people, and He was protecting them, and he, he was on them. He was above them. When Jesus came, we found that Jesus dwelled with them, God with us, Emmanuel. God dwelt with His people. But the Holy Spirit dwells in us. So you have on, with, in. And we are in the age of the Spirit. And so we read, of course, in Joel chapter 2, verse 28 and 29, that the Holy Spirit of God is foretold. There is this promise of the Holy Spirit. Here God announces that He would be the administrator of the promise. He's in charge of it. He determines how this is going to happen. And He says that He will pour out His Spirit on all flesh, upon all nations. Looking closer at this prophecy, we're going to see that there are several key items regarding this. The first one being this. He talks about... Uh, when 
it will occur. Joel mentions the time in which this will occur. He actually says it will come to pass in latter times or in the latter days. Uh, some translations will say uh, in the last days, some say latter days, and this has reference to what's called the dispensation of grace. And that might sound like a pretty complicated term. It really isn't. It's actually just describing uh, the church age. It refers to the creation, the expansion of the church. In Matthew 16, uh, verse 18 talks about this. And God bestowed grace on human beings through Jesus Christ and the coming Holy Spirit into the lives of believers. This is what we have. We have the death of Jesus and the resurrection of Jesus, and we have the coming of the Holy Spirit, and that inaugurates the church age or the dispensation of grace. And Pentecost was the beginning of those last days or the latter days. And we know that because in the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 to 3, it says this, In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, He has spoken to us by His Son, whom He appointed heir over all things, and through Him, through whom He also made the universe. The Son is the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of His being, sustaining all things by His powerful word. After He had provided purification for sins, He sat down at the right hand in the majesty in heaven. And so even the author of the book of Hebrews understood that there was this language of these last days. Jesus ascends, we now enter into the last days. So if anyone asks you this question, do you believe we are in the last days? Your answer should be yes. We are officially one day closer to the coming of Jesus, the return of Jesus, today than we were yesterday. We are in the last days. And this is an understanding that the early church had we also know that from the book of Joel that he mentions the recipients of this outpouring of the Spirit. So not only when it'll happen, it's going to happen in the last days. It's also telling us who is going to receive this Holy Spirit. And that's the audience. He says, upon all flesh. And here, Joel speaks of all nations, both Jew and Gentile. And this, for the first time, you have Gentiles included in a promise in terms of God's outpouring of His grace and things. The term all flesh means all nations, and I might mention that uh, on the day of Pentecost, it does tell us that in Jerusalem, every nation that had Jewish community in it was represented on that day. And if you go ahead and you read the book of Acts, specifically chapter 2, you're going to find there's this great list of where people were coming from. And it was indicative of the known world in their time, all nations. In Acts chapter 2, verse 5 and forward, well, let's be clear. The Holy Spirit was made available to all nations on the day of Pentecost. Everybody heard the gospel in their own language, and they even make reference to that, thinking that these disciples were all drunk because of their, what they were doing and, and how it was sounding to them. It was just an, a ridiculously amazing day that actually, if I was a fly on the wall, I would love to have been there just to observe and see what that would have been like. But the Spirit was for everyone. And that's critically important to understand as we talk about the role of the Holy Spirit in our world today. And then lastly, Joel talks about the signs that will tell the fulfillment of this. And he says that these manifestations of the Spirit, uh, they said that they will, have prophes they will prophesy, they will dream dreams, they will see visions. And they will prophesy, dream dreams, see visions. He clearly states that there will be signs that God had fulfilled His promise. And the, they shall prophesy, they shall dream dreams, they shall have visions, both Jew and Gentile alike. And as you, actually, as you go through the book of Acts, remember, the original title of the book of Acts was the Acts of the Holy Spirit. You see in Acts chapter 9, Acts chapter 10, uh, verses 1 to 6, Acts 10, 9 to 17, Acts 21, 8 and 9, all of these things are taking place. Jew and Gentile alike, experiencing the Holy Spirit, dreams, visions, prophesying, all taking place. So it's important then for us to understand that if Joel is proclaiming this promise that comes from God that the Holy Spirit is going to be poured out on all those, all nations, who call on the name of Jesus Christ for salvation, then it's critically important that we do not diminish the role of the Holy Spirit in the lives of believers. The Holy Spirit is important and should never be diminished. As a matter of fact, Jesus even took it a step further. You can say that Jesus was emphasizing the role of the Holy Spirit. In John chapter 16, verse 7, Jesus says, But I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. 
For if I do not go away, the helper, uh, the comforter, the advocate, the intercessor, the counselor, the strengthener, the standby, will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him, talking about the Holy Spirit, to you to be in close fellowship with you. So essentially what's being said here is that it is better to have the Holy Spirit in us than Jesus beside us. What? That's... What? I mean, all my Christian walk, I would, I would sit there and I would contemplate and think about what would life be like if I actually just got to walk with Jesus, with Jesus right beside me, what would we do? What kinds of things would we get into? What kinds of things would I hear him say? All these different sorts of pieces. And I, and I linger on that because I would so desire that. But Jesus says that something better is in place for us. It is better that he goes so that the comforter will come. Now, this is an encouragement that he's given. But prior to that, he was giving them some bad news. And John, uh, he was telling them specifically in verses 1 through 6, that Jesus had just told his disciples that they were going to be hated and persecuted in chapter 15, verse 18 to 21. They had seen Jesus be mistreated and, uh, and hated, and now, were needed, now they needed to realize that they were going to be treated the same way since they were with Jesus. And because Jesus was going away to the Father in the world, the world was going to become aggressive towards them. In this world you will have trouble. If they hated me, they will also then hate you. But Jesus had good reason for giving them this bad news. Jesus wanted to give them a fair warning so that they wouldn't go astray. He wanted to reveal these things to them so that when persecution came, they would remember that he warned them. You know, it's interesting to me. Some of us uh, in, in coming to Christ, we've been told things like this. If you come to Jesus, Jesus is going to make your life better. All the bad stuff in your life is just going to go away. You're never going to have any problems, never going to have any troubles in life. A lot of us were communicated, like that's the gospel that was communicated to us. And unfortunately, that's just not true. Jesus says it in this world, you will have trouble, but don't worry, I've overcome the world. But in this world, you're still going to have trouble. And when we tell people that they won't, then we get into this place that when people have troubles and face persecution or are blindsided by things that come their way, question, they start to question everything including God, including His presence in their life. And I have found that at times people lose faith. But if I become a Christian with the full knowledge that there will be trouble for those who oppose, by those who oppose Christ, I can prepare myself for when that trouble comes. If I know going into this, the world hated Jesus, they're going to hate me, I can prepare for that. I can be ready for that. I can get my heart strengthened towards that. It causes me to lean into Scripture, lean into prayer, lean into service, lean into worship. That's what it causes me to do so that I'm strengthened for when that day comes. Jesus talked about persecution before, but now it was a lot closer. So it was time to speak in specifics rather than generalities. He needed to forewarn them that they were going to be put out of the synagogue and that the enemy was going to try to kill them. And the enemy in this case, of course, is Satan, the devil. And now that Jesus was going to be leaving them, they would be targets of persecution. And so now was the time to explain all of this so that when the time came, their faith would not fail. Verse 6, you are filled with grief. You see, Jesus realizes, even at this point, that the disciples are grief-stricken over the news that he was going to be going away and all the hardships that they were going to face. And if you really think about it, this is like one of those double whammies for the disciples. Not only is their Lord, their master, their teacher, their rabbi going away, and not just all of these things, but they were in personal, close relationship with him. So he's actually one of their closest friends as well. He's leaving them, and not only is he leaving them, but they were going to experience all this different kind of persecution that was coming away. Like, there's nothing to be joyful about in this scenario. And he says to them, for your own good, I am going away. Can you imagine hearing that for the first time? It's better for you that I'm leaving. It's not you, it's me. <laughs> you know, it's that kind of stuff. Why does Jesus leave? Well, he actually tells us that it's for our own good. He says, so that the counselor can come. 
Not that the Holy Spirit is absent with Jesus there, but Jesus and the Holy Spirit are so closely identified together that we can't really tell them apart that much when you see what Jesus is doing in the world around us. But he does say, but if I go, the counselor comes, and that is incredibly good news. Now, I have to say that there is an understanding of the Holy Spirit that we need to have in order to be able to continue to walk forward in this. The word paraclete is a word that's used to describe the Holy Spirit. It's translated in this particular passage as counselor. Other translations will translate it as advocate or comforter. And not in the soothing sense. More of a personal trainer than a therapist, really. But paraclete also has another definition that I think is critically important for us to understand as we talk about the idea of coming up against persecution, coming up against insecurities, coming up against the evil one. Paraclete is an ancient warrior's term for Greek soldiers. Uh, Greek soldiers were paired up. And as you were paired up, the idea was is that whenever you entered into battle, whenever there was an attack, whenever you were on defense, you were back to back with this person. They were your paraclete. They were your helper. They were your um, standby. They were the ones who came in and, and you were able to be able to stand firm in whatever it is that you were doing in dealing with this attack coming or even going on the attack. They were the ones who strengthened you in this battle. And so the idea was that they could draw together, they go back to back, and they would cover each other's side. Think about that for a second. That's the language used about the Holy Spirit. And so what we could say is this, is that our battle partner is the Holy Spirit. Your battle partner in life is the Holy Spirit. Whatever insecurities you're dealing with, whatever doubts you're dealing with, whatever um, uh, past issues you're dealing with, if you're dealing with unforgiveness, bitterness, feeling like you're not loved, feeling like you're unwanted, feeling like nobody in the world wants anything to do with you, feeling like you're too far gone for God, what you need to know, and this is so important, is that the Holy Spirit has got your back. He is your battle partner, battle ready all the time with you. Always. He's got your back. Our battle partner is the Holy Spirit. And this idea of comforter is the idea of literally to make strong. And so the Holy Spirit is here not to make us comfortable, but to make us strong. And I think sometimes we treat the Holy Spirit as if He's there and it's kind of like we're this kitten that He's holding and He's just soothing us until we get to the point of purring. When in reality, He's sharpening our claws. For the attack that's coming. See, that's what the Holy Spirit is more about. Strengthening us for the battle. Remember, he's much more of a personal trainer than a therapist. And it's not that the Holy Spirit doesn't help us deal with all those things that are internal within us, but understand that the purpose in these things is to strengthen us for what we have ahead. And what we find in this is an amazing example of what this looks like in the book of Acts. In the book of Acts, chapter 4, verses 8 to 14, actually 8 to 22 is where we're going to be looking. The early church started out strong. Things were exciting. Thousands of people were coming to faith. Uh, They were following Jesus. There were mighty signs and wonders and healings and etc. going on all the time. And the church was experiencing phenomenal growth. As a matter of fact, when Jesus uh, gave this... uh, Uh, His Holy Spirit, it fell on the disciples. They were talking all amongst, you know, in all these different languages that people were hearing, hearing the gospel. Peter stands up, confronts the crowd, all the people of these different nations, challenges them with the gospel. 3,000 were added to their number that day. And we come to a story now where their numbers have grown up to about that 5,000 men mark. The church was experiencing phenomenal growth, but all of a sudden, things began to change dramatically. The honeymoon phase was over. The opposition to the church had begun to grow stronger and stronger. And I want us to realize that it's not if, but when we face opposition from the enemy, that these things are going to come. I want us to realize that it's not if, but when opposition from the enemy will come. You're going to be living out your Christian walk. And maybe after today, you're going to say, you know what, I'm going to take my life a little bit more seriously with Jesus, and I'm going to allow the Holy Spirit more freedom to maneuver within my life to make me more like His Son, more like Jesus. And and in doing so, what you need to understand immediately is that the evil one is going to tempt you. 
There are things that are going to come about in life that's going to make you feel like this isn't worth it, that you're not strong enough to do this. But I want to let you know that the Holy Spirit is your battle partner. And yeah, greater is He that is in you than he that is in the world. Doesn't that sound like battle language to you? In Acts chapter 4, what we realize here is that as God moves, we should expect resistance to the gospel. You shouldn't wait for resistance to the gospel. You should prepare for it is is the idea that I want us to get into here. A group of people that were arrested, uh, Peter, were powerful. The captain of the temple guard, the priest second only to the power of the high priest, is one of the people that were arresting them. And the Sadducees were a powerful group of leaders who interpreted and enforced Jerusalem's religious laws. And they interpreted Peter's sermon because they had seen and heard enough. They, sorry, they interrupted Peter's sermon because they'd seen and heard enough. And their specific complaint was the proclamation of the resurrection of Jesus. Now, you may not necessarily understand why that's important, but here's why. The Sadducees did not believe in an afterlife. The Pharisees did, but the Sadducees did not. And if the Sadducees are the ones who are responsible for the religious laws of their day, and along comes Peter and he's preaching the resurrection of Jesus, that's an afterlife statement. And they interrupt and they arrest. Now, were Peter and John surprised? No, of course they weren't surprised. Why weren't they surprised? Well, because they had seen resistance to Jesus before. They expected resistance. We have an enemy. And he is in control of those who are spiritually dead. And if people resisted and rejected Jesus, then they're going to resist and reject us. we got to understand that in this walk that we have in front of us, this is not a life of leisure. We're called into the army of God. We're called into a battleground that the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. Gates don't move, which means we're on the offense. And we go in, but we're not kept in. We go in, and it's like a rescue mission. It's like spiritual SEAL team. And you're going in, and you're rescuing people, and we're coming out. We have an enemy. He's in control of the spiritual dead. If people resisted Jesus, they're going to resist us. And by the way, this does not give us an excuse not to present the gospel. As a matter of fact, what we find is that Peter and John healed a man and then explained what God had been doing to a group of people eager to hear, and that got them in trouble. Now, the other thing that comes along with this is that we need to be ready to speak the truth. Peter and John spent time in jail, and then they had, uh, they had, got, sorry, they had to go before men who had being high priest or would be high priest, two of these men were directly responsible for giving the order to crucify Jesus. This was the most powerful family in all of Israel. And Peter and John stood before them. Now, I want you to notice something here. They were questioned about who gave them the power and by what authority they performed these actions and to preach what they were preaching. Jesus was asked the exact same question. They asked Jesus the exact same question. The Sanhedrin was a religious authority in Jerusalem and were a group who had Jesus crucified. To have healing and preaching being done in His name, which really means by His authority, was a direct challenge to their decision to kill Him. This is not light stuff. This is big. And it's changing the landscape. I want you to notice that Peter did not defend himself nor his rights. He didn't even debate the priests. Instead, he just simply proclaimed the very gospel that got him thrown in jail in the first place. He told them what matters. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven or sorry, under heaven given to men by which they must be saved. So here they are, they're saying, by what name, by what power, by what authority do you do this? Let me tell you about Jesus. Let me tell you about salvation. That's what they did. And they didn't compromise that truth. It was typical for the Jewish court system to treat ordinary people gently because it was assumed that they were ignorant, that they weren't well-learned people. They're usually left off, you know, for the first time with a warning. It's kind of like, you know, just getting a warning from a police officer if you're just slightly over a speed limit. The Sanhedrin had a closed meeting and came up with a solution to the problem. The solution would be that they could continue to do whatever they want, but they couldn't do it in the name of Jesus. Basically, they didn't care what they did as long as they didn't follow Jesus' commands to be His witness. Now, you might be wondering, Rob, how is this an example of the Holy Spirit? It's right here 
It's in verse 8 of chapter 4. The key to the whole passage and the begin- is at the beginning. It's in verse 8 where Luke tells us that Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, The key here is that Peter, after a night of being in prison, having to deal with all the filth and the degradation and the pain, did not attempt to stand on his own strength at all. It wasn't about him. He did not attack his audience, and nor does he attempt to proclaim his innocence. He does exactly what Jesus told his disciples to do back in Matthew chapter 10, verses 19 and 20. See, here's what that says. But when they hand you over, listen, when they hand you over, what's happening here right now? They are being handed over. When they hand you over, do not worry about how to respond or what to say. In that hour, you will be given what to say. For it will not be you speaking, but listen, but the Spirit of your Father speaking through you. So what's being said here? Look, guys, when they hand you over, don't worry about what you got to say. Don't worry about it. The paraclete, the Holy Spirit, the one who's got your back for the battle, strengthening you for the battle, he's got your back, and he's actually going to give you what to say. You don't got to worry about a thing. Think about that for a moment. For all of us who are worried about sharing the gospel message to our family members, to our friends, to our coworkers, listen, do not worry about how to respond or what to say. In your hour, sorry, in that hour, you will be given what to say. That same Spirit dwells within you today and will give you what to say. See, we don't got to worry about anything. He's got us. There's this otherworldly aspect to what Peter did here. We all have to deal with those times when we've been called out for some reason, and we have to give defense to something. And, it, and, and so what do we do? Well, we rehearse things, right? We say, okay, I'm going to say this, and then I'm going to say this, and then I'm going to say this. And if they say this, then I'm going to say this. And we're mapping out this conversation in our heads. We rehearse it so that we don't get caught by surprise. And we don't want to look foolish when, or even be tripped up by people in their questions. And yet here Jesus is telling us, and here Peter is putting into practice the art of being a mouthpiece for God himself. You catch that? We get to be a mouthpiece for God where God himself is actually going to speak through us. I mean, have you ever had one of those conversations where somebody asks you something and some answers are coming out of your mouth and you're sounding so much more intelligent than you know you are? I have had that regularly. You just ask Janet. It happens a lot. I sound way more intelligent than I actually am. We get to be the mouthpiece of God. And Luke wants us to focus on this point. That's why he so carefully tells us this wonderful little bit of information. He's not just coloring a picture for us. He's wanting us to grab hold of this key piece of spiritual wisdom and knowledge. That is the Spirit of God filling us that prepares us. We're to understand that We are to allow the Holy Spirit to fill us with wisdom and discernment and knowledge. And we are to trust in the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives when we find ourselves being confronted or asked difficult questions or facing difficult challenges. So what would that look like for you this week? I mean, we see that it's the Holy Spirit is prophesied from the Old Testament, that Jesus emphasizes the Holy Spirit being critical to us living out faith in our lives. Better that He goes so that the Comforter will come. And we understand then that the role of the Comforter is to prepare us, to walk with us, to guide us, to empower us. And then we see Peter experiencing that exact thing. What would it look like for you this week? What would it look like for you to do just one thing this week? What is one thing you could do this week to lean more on the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of promise? What is it? Now, for some of us, maybe it's getting to know the Spirit a little bit more. Okay, well, then read the book of Acts. Just read it. Go back and look what Jesus says about 
the Holy Spirit, that, that the Holy Spirit is going to speak for us, not to worry about what words are going to come out of our mouth because the Holy Spirit is going to take care of that for us. Uh, maybe it's the idea that it's better that Jesus goes so that the Holy Spirit comes, and, and maybe that's a brand new idea for you, that it's better to have the Holy Spirit in us than Jesus beside us. Or maybe for some of us, it is time that we just take a stand and we say, you know what, forget this, I've been living my life on my own power, it's not working, I'm anxious, I'm critical, I'm, I'm less forgiving, less loving, just all of these things that I don't like about myself. Maybe you just need to surrender the role of the Holy Spirit in your life so that He can prepare you for life so that you will become more like Jesus. What's one thing you can do this week? Let's pray. Lord God, I thank you so much for this morning and I thank you, Holy Spirit, that you dwell inside every single person that calls Jesus Lord. And so, Holy Spirit, I pray that that you will do all those things that we're told that you will do. And I pray so earnestly that we would get over our misconceptions of who you are and just trust you, knowing that you've got our backs, knowing that we don't have anything to fear, knowing that it is greater are you who are in us than he that is in the world. Would you help us to trust you more and trust us less? In your name I pray. Amen. Thanks for joining us this morning. We were so excited to have you with us. We would love to stay connected with you throughout the week. A few simple ways to do that is like us on Facebook, go follow us on Instagram, and of course, if you're looking for any information, visit us at pathwaycc.net. Again, thank you for being here with us today, and we can't wait for you to join us again next week.